recording. All right. So, so today we have with us a bunch of regulars from the channel. We have John Van Donk from sunny Southern California. We have Rod Hugan from beautiful Tucson, California, or Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we have Job from the mother country where where each of us have descended from in one way or another. Rod, Rod yesterday, Rod yesterday uh, coughed up on voices that he's Frisian, fully Frisian. Completely so. I see you all, in a whole different light now, Rodney. All four of my grandparents, purebred Frisians. So, so what are you doing with those, Del those Delft blue tiles? They don't fit in. <laughs> Wow, it has it's, come it's, to this. It's, it's, it's the wife. It's that woman that God gave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. The only, tougher, the only thing tougher than a Frieslander uh, is, a, is a woman who's married to a Frieslander. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, that's quite, that's probably true. That's probably true. <laughs> yeah. So I, I asked for this convocation because I thought it would be a fun conversation. Um, Job, I have, um, many of you know, I've, I've met Job through this channel. Rodney, I've known for years and years and years. And John Van Donk, I've known for a few years. But I, I derive tremendous joy from my relationships with, with these three men. And so I thought, I want the four of us in a conversation. I think that would be fun. And then I said, well, what do we talk about? And Job had some ideas, and I liked his last idea, which I'm going to read. What I'm personally very interested in, gentlemen, <laughs> is how each of you has been experiencing this movement. I have to figure out what this movement is. Um, over the last two years, what have you found? Where do you think it's going? What role should you play? What role might the church play? So that's our topic for conversation today. And uh, all four of us are good interviewers. And so Job has his, Job has very much established his credentials in the Discord server and on the Randos United channel. So uh, who wants, who should, let me ask this, who should we begin with? Obviously, the guy from the mother country who came up with a question seems like the obvious choice. So, okay, Job, what 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 movement is this? What on earth has happened? Yeah, that's it. That's it. All right. Why? Oh, it's 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 what Peterson's been asking basically, and he puts it differently. So it's what the hell is going on? Well, just are, just a minute before we get too far. One of the things we might want to do is do some muting here because the way that Zoom works, if any of us makes noise while Job is talking, he tends to get drowned out, drowned out. So we might want to practice some of that if you can figure out how to use the mute button. Some of you old timers who don't know how to use computers very well. It's okay. I ended up figuring it out. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Peterson wonders why he attracts all these people. What's going on? Well, uh, we've sort of, he, he's, uh, he has identified this phenomenon, but he also, as a funny, amusing side effect, has seen that it ends up getting particularly young men back into religion, but not just young men, also young women and, and older, older variants on both. And as far as I would call it a movement, I mean, that's just because I see this discord sprouting out of it. I see you, Paul, getting swamped with requests for calls. People seem to be screaming out for this sort of stuff. And I think the discord's a pretty big factor in showing that, that there's a need for this thing that, well, I don't know what it was before we gave it shape in Discord, because I can't imagine it didn't exist, but I think it was isolated in small groups and maybe in individuals through different channels. Now, so why don't you flesh out a little bit, Joe, because 
there's about 300 some people on our Discord server right now. And so there's way, way more who are gonna be listening to this and I should probably do like a introductory video explaining how it is and how to get on and all of that. But, but this thing, I just had lunch with Benedict in fact today and this thing is just really impacting people deeply. Yeah, I mean, as far as, as activity versus membership, there's of course going to be a discrepancy. I think we have at least, let's say we have 60 active members and activity varies through time zones. We have the European uh, part coming online, but the Americans are dominating in, in amount of members being active. So you can really see it pick up at about European dinner time in general. And then usually in the morning when I wake up, there's like loads of messages and pages of backlogs to, to crawl through. That's kind of becoming unhandleable at this point. I just kind of got through. And, uh, but the conversations are about all sorts, from simple jokes to really deep philosophical conversations that we actually had to move to a separate channel because it was just absolutely drowning out the main channel in deep, metaphysical conversations between a, a subset of, of members but also people split off and make their own content like uh, I started a, a reading group with a couple of people where we read the grief observed and suddenly there's another reading group reading Kierkegaard's from sickness until death unto death it's like hey I didn't even know that it happened totally outside my uh, I thought I was aware of whatever was going on on this server, but I had no idea. And it was such a great surprise. Um, Esther's doing conversations. Uh, Jeff and, and, and Luke, and it, it's just going places. And, and I'm really curious to see where it's going further. Um, we've had some very emotional interactions where people struggle with, with deep let's say addictions and, and existential issues and you can see that the community is very warm and, and, and engaging and let's say not very judgmental really trying to help and and i hope it can stay that way um because you know you see sometimes some debates happen and and people disagree so particularly today i said that i hope that this Discord server could embody Peterson's rule nine, is that, you know, assume the other person knows something you don't, so we can still disagree, but we can respectfully disagree and just still learn from each other. And I do hope, I'm just kind of gonna go on, like where do I, would I like this to go? I would like it to go further into human interaction. For instance, I'm trying to get to Frankfurt to meet with a couple of people who are around Frankfurt, but then already I'm asking myself, what more could that be than uh, hanging in a pub and chatting on how much we like Discord? It's got to be more than that. So I said to uh, Andreas, who's one of the members, said, hey, uh, what about uh, your pastor? Are they busy? Could we maybe do something with your pastor? Uh, I don't know what. It's just I'm just spitballing. But how could we take this great online thing and bring it to to back to the human interaction which i think is fundamental that's fundamental in church you, you need to 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 see the other uh, uh emmanuel levena said that you you can see god in the face of the other and we can't do that on this court we can come close but it's not the same thing we can do zoom calls but you're still not sitting next to each other you can't put the hand on the shoulder of another when they're when they're confessing their their troubles and i'd, I'd like to do that but i don't know how but I, I i think this discord is a great starting point but i i'm not sure if it's if it's if it should be the end point to me it shouldn't be the end point and as far as what role can the church play, I've been saying to people who say, oh, this is my church, you, fo you folks are my church. And so no, 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 this is not your church. Go, go, try out some, some other church. I don't know which church, try a Lutheran church, try a church. Some, some guy with a beard once told me, just go try a church. And 
I'm stuck there for a year now. So I can only advise others to try a church. And I get funny comments like, look, look at Job, you know, advising the atheist to go to church. Fine. Cool. I'll take that role. But I think that's the role the church can play. Uh, I can just keep talking. Well, what, what, so tell me, Job, what, so yeah, those who don't know, so Job, Job reached out to me very early on. We had a conversation, Job, Job and I have had four conversations and we've sort of been, um, you know, Job, Job, you've sort of been the archetypal uh, bucko in some ways through this whole thing. And, oh, God, you've, no. and you've now been ordained pastor of the discord. Um, and I mean, what, so you went to church, what role did church play? in this for you you've been doing that for a little while now and i know that you're still kind of sorting out your relationship with the church and how beliefs in god are not god i mean how, how has that what role has that played in terms of your whatever movement you're having well first off what i enjoyed i, I remember going the first time to church and i walked inside and I did not burst into flames. That was a win. I was really happy about that. But <laughs> what I liked about church is, is the people. Especially at first, the, the hymns pissed me off. And the sermons were weak. And I just wanted to talk to other people. Because I found out very quickly that these people didn't have the type of faith that I thought they had. They had struggles and questions, and they weren't so sure. Oh, great. I, so do I. Maybe we can talk. Oh, well, sure, you can come over for dinner. Oh, we're having this group dinner. Why don't you come? And then you meet all these people, and it turns out, well, this person goes to philosophy club. Oh, well, how about that? And this other person reads books, and this other person writes poems. And, and here I came in expecting all these people know what they believe and the people so far who i've met don't they don't and that's really then you meet because you have a connection that you can 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 discuss things over and then i just went again and again and again and it became sort of a part of the week now i tried not to go that didn't help so i kept going and well, then eventually, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I, I still don't take part in communion. I don't think I can. That's, that's because I don't uh, accept the, the incarnation and the resurrection. We can talk about that since today. I had an hour and a half discussion with my pastor on similar things. But the church doesn't mind. I can just sit in the upper balcony. That's fine. I don't like it because it places me outside of the church, but the church is open to me and they were okay with me becoming a member. It was all cool. So now I have this great place. I know loads more people. I've been, I've been borrowing books from other people. I've been, I, they, I, I've been over at their house for dinner. They've been over at my house for dinner. So that thing I really wanted turned out to be church and it's the last place I would have looked. So, yeah, again, Paul, thank you. Uh, it's my, it's I, my pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. And, and in your case, though, you, had, you already had some friends who were in church, and that was a big help. Yes, lots of people in the fire department uh, were going to church. Uh, it, the fire department, is, I live in a quite conservative village. And so there's like, you know, two, two churches down my street and one another street further. And there's like 12 in my town, I think, 24,000 people. And one of the first questions when I joined the fire department 11 years ago was like, well, which church do you go to? And I had just moved into this village. And I said, well, I don't. And I said, well, how can you have morals? I said, well, in Matthew, it says you shouldn't judge me about that. And then it was okay, because like, I'll slap you at your own book. Don't come at me. But, <laughs> but they would sometimes ask, why don't you come to church? Because clearly you have a background, you have all this knowledge. 
because you know, I, yeah, I was interested in religion and I went to church as a, as a kid. But they would sometimes ask him, like, like, no, 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 no. And then at some point, we had this, with the, we had this, this, you know, with together. I kind of all came together with Peterson and for your videos and having a training exercise in the church and kind of noticing, oh yeah, it was, this is kind of nice to be in this building. There's something here. And then at that same evening, the uh, a co-worker of, on the fire department became, uh, he said, hey, I'm going to be um, confirmed as an elder. Would you like to come? So there's been some interesting synchronicities in that way that it all came together. I'm like, sure, why not? And then combined with you advising me to go to church, well, that's how that went. Do you guys have any questions for Job? I, I really have an appreciation for the, the gathering face-to-face, -face, right? I, I was just talking to um, somebody on Facebook this week um, who thought I was deaf, because I partially am, um, but it's only partial. And, uh, but I was born not able to see very well, almost legally blind. And so for the first eight years of my life, I kind of stumbled around in the dark. And, um, but all of my other senses just really are way over the top. So my hearing was outstanding. Uh, sense of smell, sense of touch, taste, all of those, because you depend on that when you're blind and or almost blind. And so, um, so being in a room with someone, uh, just from the sensory perceptions is so important to me because I, I don't know, do you smell fear? I, do you, you know, do you, do you taste anxiety? Do you, like, do you, I just feel deeply often, and I and I think, as much as I love Zoom and I love having conversations across the sea with people I don't even know, except from these kind of conversations um, and some writing, um, <clears throat> I I love it because the face to face matters, and and then it's harder when you touch somebody when you're looking them in the eye. Um, you know, we live in this meme driven world where we just spout off platitudes and memes and and we live in that world and that's not that's not real that's that's uh, it's a starting point it's i used to say there's this generation has more ways to communicate than any generation in history and does less of it than any generation in history and um when you talk about actual communication like in-depth communication um on the big issues of life um so so I'm really impressed, uh, Joe, with with that part of your story, the, the necessity to be together in a room. And then I think there's just, there's a spiritual connection. I, I really appreciated what you said about walking into a church building and feeling something. It's not, it's not just, I don't know, there's something about, about um, proximity that matters and uh, it matters deeply. And so, um, and that's certainly been my experience and it's my longing and it's uh, it's also my difficulty with this whole medium it's the it's the the difficulty i have with with connection through it i realize it's real but i but it's it's not the depth that i long for um i mean i would love joe because i hear you're a great cook uh, to come over to your house and sit and eat dinner, um, that would be a highlight of a trip to the Netherlands for me. And um, and I would love for you to come out to Tucson, and I can make you my famous tamales, and and uh, <clears throat> we could hang out. I I think there's something about that because I think then it's it isn't just the words at, at the village at the church I pastor. We often talk about listening beneath the words because people use words all the time, but you have to listen beneath the words to hear what's really going on in someone's life and to understand what's really happening. And so, um, so I just appreciate that perspective. And I am glad that, that it's not just, oh, we can converse on the Discord channel, beautiful as that might be, um, that we can actually go to Frankfurt and sit in somebody's living room and talk. Frisian tamales, huh? <laughs> Tamales, yes. Frisian tamales. I make fabulous tamales. I just, my mother-in-law's name is Juanita, and 
she uh, is from the hills of Arkansas, and she once worked as a bookkeeper in a Mexican restaurant, and the nice little Mexican ladies taught her how to make tamales, and she taught her daughter who taught me. So we are tamale mm. kings. <laughs> <laughs> And and in Rod's church, Rod, in your church, you have a meal, you have a meal together, not just as the ceremonial meal of the Lord's Supper or communion, but as Perfect. a church, as a congregation, your church is laid out as sort of a big living room, and you have a meal together. The kitchen, um, we de we designed the kitchen before we designed anything, with a long serving line um, and multiple ovens and um, and refrigerators and so forth for the sole purpose of eating together because there's something you know i i when i read scripture jesus is always he has his greatest reputation is he's a drunkard a glutton and a friend of sinners how great is that right that, that like how do you get the reputation of being a drunk and a glutton if you're not eating and partying and hanging out with people who do so i i just love that that picture of jesus and um and so, yeah, being around, there's something about sitting down over dinner um, that opens our mouths and our hearts to each other. And um, and you can't do that on Discord or on Zoom or any other way. <laughs> Although I could, I could go grab a tamale and eat it, I suppose, in front of you. <laughs> that would be cruel. <laughs> and I can testify that what Rod just said is totally true because I went to the... Uh, <clears throat> to the conference that the village church put on last year and uh, about 40 50 percent of it was eating together and it was a uh, it was a lovely experience and um, you guys do that very well i do have some questions for um for joe because you know you rolled into this church and you tell me that you didn't find it very difficult to discover that other people had questions also. And then somehow you snuck in there that you became a member of that church. And I appreciate you making the distinction yourself about whether or not you participate in communion. But do you think there is something unusual about that particular church that, in fact, the asking of hard questions is encouraged and scoff laws and atheists like yourself are allowed to be members. Yes. How would you describe that church as unusual compared to other churches? Now, <clears throat> first off, my, my church experience is limited. Um, I've been to the, the, let's say the more conservative denominations on, on a few occasions. And I, I don't get, I, I, uh, I have to be careful. The somewhat more conservative churches seem to be a bit more literate for instance, uh, I, I am part of a sort of church men's discussion group of a more strict church. I was invited by a firefighter. And for instance, there was the, 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 the story about uh, obeying God, uh, which was illustrated through uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. And so we talked about the story and this is not. And I said, well, could it be that this story is symbolism? No, 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 definitely not. I said, could it not be about that this particular tribe did not do human sacrifice while tribes around them did? Could it be to illustrate that? No, happened. <coughs> okay, that's that. But I, I noticed that when I tried to engage in a well what could the underlying meaning be that that there's a very literal thing that shall not be torn at while i'm getting the impression that at my current church and not everybody cares but there are people who i can discuss that with 
well, at the more stricter churches, there seems to be more the case of that's not for you to think about. And that can put, I can imagine that that can put people off. Like, well, here I have a question and I'd like an answer. I do not like to hear the answer that I should not get an answer or, not, or even think about it. So that's, that's also discouraging me from joining a bit more stricter church. Because How do you think that church came to be like that? Let's see. Well, there was a guy and he, he took a hammer and a bunch of things he had thought about and nailed them to a church door basically that's that's how it started now <laughs> uh no but but how do you think the church became like that your particular church my church yeah how did your church get to be so open and freizinnig i think it's the usual schism of people like no i don't believe this i'm starting my own church and then a pe bunch of people joined them and and you, you eventually end up with a church where, now, um, for instance, that's one thing I, I have for myself criticized in my church as much as I love it, is that most of the sermons are, Jesus loves you, you can be happy about that, happy, happy, joy, joy, let's sing another hymn. And I'm like, wait a second, where is my responsibility and suffering? I need to hear this too. And I don't get to hear that. And, and to me, there should, the church, should, oh God, here, and here I go on my preaching chair. The church should tell a person how to be, or at least help them figure out how they should be. And that Jesus helps you with that, awesome, because we need all the help we can get. But to kind of lay a proper foundation for what, what how you might behave, that's, that's, I wish I heard that a bit more in the existential sense. But then again, then I'm imposing my wants on a church that I've barely been in. So, but that stuff you hear in the strict church a bit more. Mm. But in the strict church, there'd be other things. So, you know, at some point you got to make a choice and you're going to suffer either way. So, <laughs> but how the church became that way i mean i th honestly john i think it was just schisms and and i mean for for instance uh there was this nashville document a while ago uh which which was divisive Pe people took stances on that and the church i go to was pretty clear in that anybody's welcome and that was pretty explicit Okay, so they took a stand on that. And, and then they, but we also recently had a, a meeting where a local politician was there in the evening, which was about identity and meaning and why are people leaving the church and why aren't they coming back? And, and what, what should the church do? And I said, well, isn't this the issue with the fact that God is dead and that we lost the narrative? and that we, we can't find this new narrative. And the, the church tries to impose its narrative, but the church doesn't know either because it's constructed a whole bunch of narratives. So to any outsider, it looks like, yeah, it's not like they know. So I don't know, I'm, I'm going on a tangent, but this, the church I'm in seems to also still be figuring itself out. Like in the last church membership magazine, this is an 800 member church, they changed the they changed the requirements for you to partake in communion you don't let's see i have to get this right you didn't you did have no long you didn't have to any longer i think accept the sacrifice of jesus you had to, you you just had to love god and i'm reading that and thinking what it's it's kind of fundamental though to take communion to, I mean, so legally I can now, but I'm not gonna, because to me, that's not what communion is about. I'd, I'd better accept the resurrection first. So there's still, because, and the reason was that, that the, the, it was divisive, that not everybody could partake was divisive. Like, yeah, but, but, but to make, I don't know. I, 
I can't really judge that because it's very easy to judge. But if I'm not in their shoes and I'm not making those decisions, but it seems sort of, it seems sort of strange to me that, well, we have an issue that this thing is perceived as divisive, then we'll remove the barrier. But now where is the essence? Mm, yeah. So I, I'm going to sound like a conservative, but I sometimes wonder <laughs> if churches should, should just change in order to, in order to uh, uh, bring something forward to, in order to reach out to others. We have, we have a particular thing in the Netherlands is that the, the more conservative streams, uh, variations, they either re remain stable in size or they grow. And I think that has to do with that they are very clear in what they stand for and what they don't stand for. And the only way those churches change is through schisms. I think that might not be true. And then I sort of wonder where we're looking at churches that almost appear secular, but not really because, because God loves you. And I'm not saying my church is particularly like that, but. Well, I think the reason why this whole question and this whole conversation is particularly relevant is that we are doing two things. We are saying, okay, in this, day and age of a lot of questioning and discussion and conversation and the way that people are often disconnected from each other because of their use of uh, high-tech um, electronic media and the need for them to come together. We, the four of us, seem to have concluded that the natural place where this should happen is a church. But we're also saying at the same time that not every church is capable of welcoming all the randos and all the buckos and all the other people that Paul Van der Klee uh, gathers around himself. And, 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 and then we're also saying that, well, there's also that thing about church, about the essence of church that gets lost when you open your doors to anybody and everybody, and you don't want to offend anybody, and you don't want to draw any barriers. I know that um, in seminary, I learned about the uh, overture from the Ocheedon, uh, Iowa uh, class or congregation that once upon a time wanted to have a separate curriculum for uh, Sunday school kids as opposed to the covenant youth, because after all, they were very different. And now we have a two-tier church membership. That was the point that was made in, the, in this particular class. Two-tier church membership, one for the people that really get it and one for the ones that don't. And so it sounds to me like in your church, people go to great lengths to make you feel welcome. I mean, once upon a time, your pastor uh, discouraged you from partaking in communion, and now the whole church is informed that it is okay for all people like Job van Achterberg to participate in communion. This is a change in church policy, possibly precipitated by your presence there. God, I hope not. <laughs> no, but <laughs> it's not out of the question. So then, then okay, then we're, we're really saying, okay, well, what church are we welcoming people into? What church, what kind of church is Paul going to send all his listeners in this channel, all his subscribers, what church is he going to send them to? The ones that are capable of welcoming them and inviting them in and practice hospitality on their terms? Or is there a part of the, the actual core identity of a church that needs to be reserved for those who believe in the core doctrines of that church? Personally? Oh, sorry, Rod, go ahead. No, that's fine. I, th this is particularly interesting to me because we do have two tiers of membership. Each year we have a belonging service at the village and you sign up for a year. Um, and 
um, that's coming up next month. And so we're going to have this belonging service. And to do that, you go up and you sign a covenant. You say, for the following year, this is my community. I'm going to submit to some of the, what you know to the, what the leaders say to these basic doctrines, etc. Uh, the resurrection being one of them, which is uh, huge, right? And then you're because you do that, you are most assuredly deeply part of who we are, and you can teach and you can lead and you can do all the things that members do. Um, we have a second tier of membership, which is. Uh, and we kind of call it, I don't know, we've never really come up with a name, but that there's, um, you're sort of the cousin, right? Like you have a family reunion and there's the, the family and then there's these distant cousins that are there and they can come and they can also participate and they can say, this is my community. I don't, I'm not sure that I believe in God. I'm not sure I believe the tenets of, of and I, I'm not willing to sign this covenant, but i feel deeply that this is my community this is where i belong this is this is these are people who love me and who i love and i've come to care about and that they think about me and i think about them and so i want them so so you can also just basically make that statement and say this is my community without the um without the specifics of the doctrinal stands and so forth um but that's by, and I appreciate what you said. That's limiting, right? That limits your total participation. Where, much as I consider you a lovely pastor, Joe, you're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be preaching at the village anytime soon, unless you can preach on the resurrection of of Jesus and say that's a real thing, and I believe that, right? Um, so there's gonna be, and I think that's just important. Um, I think that doesn't change hospitality. Hospitality is knowing where the other person is and then inviting them as far as they can go into what you do. And I think actually those agendas um, work on both sides of the equation. So Paul, um, you you sent a young man my way um, recently, uh, Nathan McCormick and, and uh, his girlfriend, uh, Darla, and they, came and they're not professing to be anything other than atheists and they're not pretending to be something that they're not and i attended their little philosophy discussion group i unfortunately missed last night um due to the ministry stuff but um i intend to be part of that and they invited me in and they were excited that i was there and we conversed and and i asked what's the purpose of this group why are you gathered what what do you do what's What's the what's your point? Why do you gather? Well, they're trying to you know they have Jordan Peterson aficionados and they have they have philosophy studiers and they have different people who are in some ways disaffiliated in other in any way other than this group that meets on Tuesday night. Well, um, I, I appreciated that that Nathan and Darla came to church on a couple Sunday mornings ago and then returned the following Sunday and are talking about being, you know, regularly part of our community. I love that. I love, uh, I love the conversations, but I realized in talking to him that he has, he has an agenda too. His, his agenda is to increase the communication between people of faith and people who um, are atheists like he he wants to take away the all the judgment and the yelling and the screaming and and have face to face conversations. So he comes to us with an agenda. I like that. I'm not upset about that at all. I I find that refreshing and exciting and good, and and try to engage that. And so he's always looking for common ground. So I'll say, well, at the church we do this, and then he says, well, I do this, and. And so we're trying to find that those those common spaces, which I think is the essence of hospitality and the nature of hospitality and it's the nature of being together is, yeah, we don't think alike and we don't have the same experience. I can't, he cannot possibly convince me that God doesn't exist. It's not going to ever be possible because I have these deep encounters with God and they're precious to me and I hold on. So that's my, so, so he's not going to change me. And in some ways he's deeply true to his roots and he doesn't believe and that's, and I'm fine with that. 
except there's this 1% of 1% of 1% maybe chance that maybe Rod has a lot of doubt and sometimes some event will change his mind and he won't be um, a preacher and a follower of Jesus. And, and, uh, and, and he would say the same, like, and there's that part of me too, that we actually change completely. The other thing I think Job, that you said was talking about, you, you mentioned, who do I, uh, where's the suffering? right? Where's the struggle? Like, uh, if, if Jesus loves me and everything is great, but where's, where, where do I suffer? And I think that's a huge question. And, and I think that's a huge question for atheists and, and Christian alike. It's what do you do with suffering? And what do you do with understanding its purpose um, from, in, you know, a theological point of view, but also from just being in this world, you know, I, I love, I, I've always said Jesus's greatest promise is in this world, you will have trouble. Like that's, that's a powerful promise. Like he doesn't say you might have trouble or some of you will have trouble or it's going to be difficult for a few of you. He says in this world, you will have trouble. And, and, and that's, that's a truism that I can hang my hat on forever because that's it's experientially true and i look around me and it's true so what do i but then what do i suffer for like what's what's the suffering for what's the purpose and or who do i suffer for and so i um so i think just in talking um with nathan now with you and others i think there is this place where we can converse about um hospitably <laughs> and kindly and then also like I have a longing for you and for Nathan and for Darla to know what I what I know right that like I, there's something deep inside me that knows something like that I've bet my life on and so I, I want to share that I want to honor that and at the same time I want to hear what you staked your life on and what you truly deeply believe and I think that for me has been the joy of the Paul Pearson thing, the joy of knowing Paul Vander Clay and, and watching some of his videos. I, I, I told the philosophy group I probably ought to read Peterson's book, saying I don't even know what these things are about. Um, and they all kind of laughed at me. And then two of them admitted they hadn't read it either. So that was impressive. Um, but, but I'm not looking. Um, I think there, it's more than just looking for to find agreement. It's looking to see humanity in each other and to honor each other and to truly love each other, which I don't, um, and create space to question and to think and, um, and to be loved and to love. And when you say it that way, with using those words, to me, it almost seems like enough. It almost seems like if we do that, then we have fulfilled the law. If we do that, then we do what God wants us to do. And so um, it is a little bit hard for me to, to wrap my head around uh, the fact that Yeah, how do I say that? <laughs> um, the, the, the idea of creating what I refer to, and I've had a conversation with Paul about that, something like an outer court ministry. Hmm. Can, I, can, I, can I hook on this? Yeah. Um, a couple of things, because I think this is, this is what you're talking about, John. First off, I love the synchronicity that you and me are both wearing a red shirt and Paul and Rod are both wearing a blue polo. Now, having said that. Uh, and we both speak Dutch fluently. Yes. Yes. And all I know is a few few swear words in Yankee does that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. In the in the church magazine, there was an opening for a pastoral worker. And I figured I've been doing this stuff on Discord. Maybe I can do that in my community and really become more more a member of that community. Because I've said a couple of things just in this conversation and 
I went, you know, I love my church. They welcomed me, you know, they, they never asked me like, oh, do you believe or not? Really grateful for this place. So I figured I got to do something back and maybe I can be a pastoral worker. So I approached an elder and he said, oh, sure. And so we kind of, he kind of explained and we, we talked and then the head of the church council walked by and says, hey, is Job going to be an elder? No, <laughs> but I don't know what expectations these people have of me, but he said, okay, we're going to discuss it tomorrow in church council and we'll, I will give you a call the next day. And I discussed it with some people in the Discord and some people were positive and some people said, this is a really bad idea because you can't give people spiritual counseling. And I agreed. And I said, you know, if church council says no, perfectly fine. I totally support that. So they gave me a call and they said, well, the pastor was really happily surprised. And, you know, you're going to have, a, and I was going to have a conversation with the pastor today anyway. So why don't you discuss it with him? And then we have another meeting with you, with the pastor and the elder. Sure, why not? So I had a conversation today with my pastor. And he said, we ended up, we ended up not going through with it. Because I said, well, I don't believe, and I think that might be a bearer. He says, what are you talking about that you don't believe? You clearly do. Because he says, if you didn't believe, you would have, you would have stopped uh, Peterson's first video, and you wouldn't have kept watching it. You wouldn't have talked to some pastor from California multiple times and do all the stuff you're doing. Fair point. I concede that. But what we ended up deciding because he says you're reading all these books and you're doing all these things what i would like to do is you are on the edge of of sea and land you're walking on both sides there are more people like you and i'd like to put you out there to meet them and talk to them and that's i think what john was going to the outwards ministry is what I said, yeah, I want to show what in, what's in these walls that people don't know. And they think they know what's in these walls, but they don't. Because I, I didn't know either. So there's got to be people like me who, who haven't gone since they were a kid or they just never went. And they might be looking for something that's in church and they don't know. So I'm not entirely sure how this is going to take form. But I said, how about I do this? I'm going to make YouTube interviews with church members just hey who are you what's your life been like why did you come to church what, what are you struggling with what are you aiming for what's on the top of your hierarchy sometimes with the pastor maybe you know if the pastor is an extra guest and basically i'm being a stealing lying pastor because i'm taking paul's idea and i i i figure maybe that could work then we could because what also irritated the pastors that our church website's kind of static we can put that on there maybe do a podcast, show what we're doing, that we're very much an alive church, and through that, reach out to people. Um, and another thing he wanted me to be a co-host for was a sort of a, a reading group or a discussion group on what is there, what is more uh, about meaning making and about which could hook very well into the meaning crisis. And we could perfectly well open it up for non-church members, and we should probably open it up for non-church members. So, John, I, I mean, could that be something like, like what, what, you, what you were thinking of? Uh, you are muted, John. You need to unmute yourself. No, very much so. Uh, sorry about that. Very much so because... Um, well, I, I too met with my pastor today <laughs> and we had that same, very same conversation as to what do we do for people who, who are not 100% on board with every inch of doctrine that we profess and the package in our church is rather comprehensive. You know, it includes Christian education and blah, 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 and you know, all, the, all the hoops that people have to jump through in order to be fully vested in this church. There are plenty of people that are not there. They, they, some of them come because if they don't come to church, their wives are going to cut them off. And uh, so, hey, this is a high-risk situation. I better go to church. So the, the – hey, Rod just woke up. 
Sadly, I hear that story. So. <laughs> no, but 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 and 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 then I also know of the same population that you just spoke of, the people outside that are interested in the crisis of meaning, and that want to compare notes with other people about that. So there's this there's this there's this huge gray area of the of the the area between the nuns and duns on the one hand and committed Christians on the other, there is a spectrum there. And right in the middle, there is a whole bunch of people that, that don't fully belong, but they're not quite ready to walk away from it all either. So then what do we do for them on their terms? The, 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 the phrase on their terms is hugely important for me because um, it, it's, it seems so typical of most churches that we do our programming and we do our, um, our preaching and teaching on our terms, on the terms of the church as dictated by seminary perhaps, or by our core curriculum or our doctrinal convictions. We rarely engage with people on their terms. And, and I think there's something to be said for that and to provide a space where that is possible. Um, that's kind of, where my head is at with all this. And I'm, I, I was amazingly surprised that, that my pastor this morning over lunch seemed a lot more um, um, receptive to that idea than I had expected. I, I, I think that he realizes that there is a, a, a hard to reach audience out there that are not going to come jumping in and, and, and sign up on the dotted line and become covenant partners for the year. And uh, no, they, 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 they're curious. They may want to see what this is all about. They, they come with loads of questions and, and their own specific need for community, that their own specific need to belong somhere. So, yeah. And Joe, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Like there is no distinction in reality between the people who sign the covenant at the village and those who don't, right? As far as how they interact, how they have conversations, what groups they are part of. But I bet it affects your preaching. But there, but, but there is something about leadership and there is something about taking a lead role and, and, and incorporating, you know, we have a sign-up sheet that we pass around uh, every week and it's because everything is done by volunteers so our kids ministries and all those kinds of things so there are people who sign up to do uh, to go meet with the kids or work in the nursery well i don't know that you have to have signed a covenant to to go rock a baby in the nursery like if that's what right. i wanted to do, go rock the right. baby in the nursery right right, and, right. And so in, in, enjoy yourself and and encourage us and help us and because Heaven knows there's enough work to do and there's plenty of people to, to engage. I think, uh, but I, I do go back, Job, I think to your, um, like, what's the essence? Because if the essence of church, like, the, there's an essence of church. And, and if we walk away from that, then we're just a nice, we really are truly a great social club where we talk about morals and, and, and wonderful things like that and, and how to be together and be friendly and, and know that somewhere God loves us. But it's, there is, I don't know, there is a dividing wall. And I, and I don't know where, I, I try not to draw it because it's not my job. Um, I, I just, who, who did God put in front of me? Well, that's the person I'm supposed to love. Who, who am I meeting with today? Well, that's the person I'm supposed to love. Um, who am I talking to now? Well, that's the person I'm supposed to love and care about. I, um, so I don't, I don't get too hung up on, you know, oh, now I'm, you know, that said, we do have a members meeting and we're, we're going to have it this, this Saturday called the drumming circle and we, and everybody comes, but there are people who won't, who haven't signed our covenant who will come to the drumming circle because it's just another gathering of, of the church as far as they're concerned. But at the church, we're going to talk about our purpose, our reason for being, our values, why we do what we do. Um, and then people can say, ah, you know, I'm 80% on board with that or 60 percent on board or hey i'm just starting out i'm 10 percent on board or i'm not i don't i just wandered into the wrong building sorry um we don't know why they're there but i there is something i don't know deeply um it's fascinating
fascinating to me how God brings people into our community. It's the same fascinating way that he brings us into relationship with each other. Like, Job, there is no way on God's green earth that I could ever possibly be sitting around for two hours on a, or an hour and a half or however long this is going to be <laughs> on a, on a uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon having a conversation with someone I've never met, right? And But yet somehow through this strange thing of 47 billion years ago, Paul and I sitting in Grand Rapids is, you know, Denny's trying to close down a 24 open 24 seven uh, restaurant, having deep conversations about life. And somehow that changed and created this friendship between a guy who's in Sacramento and a guy who's in Tucson. And then out of that grows this whole thing. And then we do, we go a year or two without talking and then we have these deep intimate conversations. So there is this connection. And then somehow that leads to my conversations with you, which is, so delightful and so fun and yet um what comes of this right like is there deeper understanding deeper humanity uh deeper relationship peace in the world um uh, more joy what comes like right? what's the purpose so again i want to shift gears here and let's go back to our um we have a line here, and it's the line that brought this conversation together. And I'm gonna, we put Job on the hot seat for a little bit, so I'm gonna put Job in the uh, in the question asker seat, and he can he can badger any of the three of us if he wants to, uh, because Job says why what I'm personally very interested in, gentlemen, is how each of you have been experiencing this movement over the last two years. What have you found? Where do you think it's going? What role should you play? What role might the church play? I think we've, um, so Job, I'm gonna put that back in you and give you the, give you the pointer and uh, go ahead and have at us. Well, uh, the first one definitely is how have you experienced it? And I'm, I'm very curious whether that's very different between the three of you. I think it's different for, Rod hasn't been sort of in the mix of it the way that, that uh, John and I have Rod kind of got roped in recently with uh, with this young couple, but he's been following along. And part of what I've loved about this, it has been I I for years I have you know listened to Rod's stories of the village, and and seen what that church has been able to do in terms of uh, gathering people from a huge diversity of stories and bringing healing. And he just recently told me when I was talking to him, it used to be that he had all, there were all sorts of young women who were coming into the church needing healing from things in their past and so on and so forth. And now he seems to have a whole stream of young men. And so I, I, think, it's, I think it's just been fascinating how, one of, one of the things that I've been appreciating as we've sort of, you know, we had the Jordan Peterson moment and that seems to have been receding a bit and now, at least in my conversations, this meaning crisis seems to be a better framework within which to understand Jordan Peterson and understand other things in our culture. So it's been interesting for me to see how this connects with other things outside of necessarily uh, those interested and impacted by that Jordan Peterson moment that we've had for the last two years. But, but yeah, so, and, and Vendank, of course, got in early because he's a schemer and he had a plan for my life and, and John will not be uh, quiet until he achieves his purposes, somewhat like the Lord. So there we go. Yeah. And he sits well, back there quietly. Well, the one thing that I do want to observe about Rod is that I, I went to the conference about how to be the village church. And it was totally clear to me that if there is to be um, a church that with, with eyes wide open and with all the uh, honesty and authenticity that you can muster up to think through the issue of two-tier membership, I think you guys are it. I, 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 I am so impressed with the, uh, the, 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 a massive amount of engagement of so many people and yet the clarity with which you uphold the fact that, Hey, you're not in until you're in. 
and 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 that that I am pretty sure. Um, well, actually, not pretty sure. I'm totally sure because I've heard you guys do it. You and Eric both. You you preach to both categories of people. What I said earlier about leadership, I wasn't talking about whether those second tier people would be in leadership. No, you, you, the leadership of the village church, you always keep your audience in mind when, when, and you recognize that, that there are people there that are hundred percent in. And then there are other people there that are asking questions and that are not so sure and that are on the outside and they're kind of looking in. And I think that that is a dynamic all by itself to be able to juggle that act. To, to and then to find the rituals that encourage people to get a taste of of what it is like to be fully in what what would it be like for me to be fully in you guys have amazing ways of sharing the table even if you're not sharing the communion table you know we we share the table and you can use it as an as, a, as an entry point as an illustration this is what it means to be with Jesus he shares his table with all the rest of us. And then you have all kinds of symbolic stuff that you can, you know, work with at that time. Um, I also want to jump in away from um, Job's question a little bit, and, but back to what you were saying, um, Rod, about the essence of the thing. I wonder how much we actually allow Jesus' earthly ministry to inform our understanding of the essence of the thing. Who, who did he hang around with and what categories of people did Jesus employ in his earthly ministry? And I, I, I understand that, that in the final analysis, it is about the, about the sacrifice and about <clears throat> the redemptive work of Christ. I, I understand that, that those are all important uh, mysteries for us to tiptoe around. Um, but one of the things that we can be more clear about is that um, when Jesus decides he's going to have dinner with whomever he wants to have dinner with, there is a, there's a significant model there. There's something to be emulated. There's, there, and I, I just think that you guys at your church do that really well, but the size of your church and the location of your church and the leadership of your church also lend themselves to that. So then the next question is, okay, how can another church – buy into that model of how to how to figure out how to have a holy of holies and then the holies and then an outer court ministry and what does that look like you know what 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 would how would we need to modify our policies and procedures in order to really create a welcoming space for people who are not 100% in and 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 i think that i think that your question about the purpose of it all is legitimate but at the same time, I think that there is also such a thing as setting a table and welcoming people to come and eat. There is something sufficient about that. I, I have food. I set it on the table. You may come and sit down, and that's good enough. And, and I think that there, there is an, an element of, of that that I really want the church to be able to validate and, and not everyone is capable of validating that because there are too many guys that come out of seminary who, who, who haven't had a picture of being welcomed into a community um, for its own sake. Now I'm, all, I'm getting a little bit closer to my, little, my, my own personal journey of how to, get, how to get connected to a church, and I don't really want to use that time here. Uh, that's probably not the right place for it, but, but there, is, there is something mysterious about joining a community where people live life face to face in, in including all the suffering and the hard questions that come along with it and 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 not necessarily have to have the ultimate destiny and the ultimate purposes in the forefront at all times i'm not sure i'm saying it right but um what do you hear me say and for Job, Job, for to answer your question from my perspective, I'm not deep into this movement. I, I'm deep into meeting with young men and young women who, um, who, I mean, I got a church full of 20 and 30 year olds. So there's a ton of conversation like what you're talking about. Why I'm why why did I get involved or what what draws me? 
it's Paul, you know, like Paul and I are friends. It's relationship. It's always relationship, right? I, Paul's doing something cool. So he says, hey, Rod, you should be a part of this. And so I'm going, oh, okay. That, yeah, Paul said I should be a part of this. I'll, I'll listen to him. And then he says, you should start a meetup group. And I'm thinking, heck no. And John, you said the same thing. And it's like, I, I don't want to start a stupid meetup group. I don't know how to do that kind of junk. I, I have no interest in that. I'm busy enough as it is. I got enough tormented souls in my life uh, that I, I don't need to add more of them. And so there's this whole sense of why would I do that? But it's the same way, you know, if, if, um, if Paul says, hey, I bought a new Amana refrigerator and you ought to see that manual that came with that. I've read it from cover to cover. It's great, Rod. You should read it. Well, then I'd read it because Paul said I should. And I like Paul and we're in a relationship and he's always steered me right and given me, a, you know, given me good advice. However, some stranger says to me, hey, you should read Jordan Peterson's 12 rules thing. I go, eh, well, I, I don't care. Like, I, who are you? And um, so I think there is that intimacy the, the 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 relationship the intimate relationship that calls us to be together and so so yeah now now that forms and then around that you know people are gathered and so i don't just become friends with paul i become friends with paul's friends and he with mine and he shows up at the village and i and you came uh, to our conference and um and and now so I think that's how it works. And so I'm on the very front end of it in, in some ways. Not, I don't think I'm on the front end of it philosophically. I'm at the front end of it with the particular phrasings and words that are going around now and the, you know, this whole movement on Discord and the whole movement on, uh, with, with Jordan Peterson and as well. I, I'm on the front end of that. But in some ways, it's a new expression of a same old thing, right? Which is, I think Paul's on Mars Hill and he's reasoning with the philosophers and he's quoting poetry and he's, and then some believe and some walk away and some think he's crazy. And uh, it hasn't changed. It's the vernacular changes. And in some ways, there's surges. And I think Paul's right. There's a surge of young men that are coming to the village seeking relationships, seeking intimacy, um, trying to make sense out of life. Um, part of that's North American culture, perhaps. I don't know. But there's some cultural things around that. I was just at a meeting of about 25 pastors, and they were talking about what are the, what's the cultural realities of Tucson, Arizona. Well, it depends on where you live and who you, who you live next to. And, uh, and it's amorphous. I think we try to define it and we lose it. Um, cause in the end it's just, uh, I got to love the person in front of me. I got to talk to the person in front of me. I got a next door neighbor. Um, I've got people asking me questions about God, um, blah, blah, blah. So, so that answers Job's question. I hope. <laughs> are we wearing you out, Job? Are you, are you getting sleepy up there? And, uh, that, no, I'm good. I'm, okay. I'm trying to work through the problem. Uh, Rod, you said that it's a cycle. You said there's surges. Oh, uh, yeah. Cycle and surges are different. Cycle is, is predictable. Is, Surge, just hold it. Is atheists coming back a known surge? A non-surge? A known, known, K-N-O. No. Yeah. Um, I, in the last five years have had more con conversations with atheists than I've probably had in 30, 40 years before that. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's something interesting. There's, there's a searching going on in broader culture. I, I think as we, you know, people are looking to get out of, I don't know, there's, there's a, culture doesn't work. Life doesn't work. And when life doesn't work, what makes it work? And, oh, maybe those people over there know. And maybe they're, so there's a searching, I think, that's going on that's, that's, that's a surge in history. I don't know that it's a surge in, um, and maybe a small surge in recent history, particularly. I never know, like, is this a broader worldwide thing or is this just a 
North American thing, or is this just a Tucson thing, or is this just a people I happen to hang out with thing? But but I really have had more conversations with avowed atheists, people who say, I do not believe in God. What the heck are you doing? Why do you believe in that? Um, how can you believe in that? And Well, but it seems to me that... Yeah, it seems to me that another another perspective on that would be that we are also living in a day and age when it's become a whole lot more socially acceptable to identify yourself as an atheist. So that in, in, in times past, you may have had lots of conversations with atheists without knowing it because they were all upstanding members of your church and they showed up and paid, and paid into the budget. And, and, and meanwhile, they were really getting ready to walk away from it all. Um, I'm not saying that that actually was true in your particular church, but I am pretty sure that all the nuns and duns that we now that now identify as such, you you can't be a dun without having once been a an insider. You can't be a nun without having it kind of deflected against what you were in the past, which was identified as a Christian believer, or at least a member of a Christian church, or at least part of a Christian country. And so in, in, in some fashion right now, because it has become more socially acceptable to identify yourself as an atheist or an unbeliever or an agnostic, that opens up a whole world of conversations at any level, but including with pastors. And I, um, I, the other thing is, uh, as I think even in this conversation, we tend to think of, of church as that building that we go to on certain days of the week for certain activities, which is actually the antithesis of what I think church is. Church is a couple of us gathered in a living room, talking, praying, thinking. Like church is, a, you know, Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, right? There I am in the midst of them. There's this whole sense of church is, is in the intimate relationship. It's, and so I think, um, I, I think as American males, certainly, um, and as the, as the young men, there's a social isolation. There's a, there's um, a low-level depression, if not outright depression. There's, um, I got it, and I did this, I mean, part of my journey is I was chief financial officer of this big auto parts corporation. I was an elder in the church. I was a um, president of the school board. I was, you know, I had my degree in business administration and was ready to run the world and make a lot of the money. And I didn't find it fulfilling. It wasn't what I got everything I wanted and it wasn't what I wanted. And I think so often and I hear that story repeated. And so, you know, so my solution was to go deep into depression, spend a couple of years there, um, pile a lot of stuff on my poor wife um, and family, um, cause a lot of hurt, um, which was hard um, to remember that I did all that, but came out on the other side with this grand search for meaning. Like, um, and, and even in talking with, um, with uh, Nathan and Darla talking to Nathan the other day, you know, he says, this group is searching for big T truth. Well, aren't we all, you know, like that's for what's a big T truth. And in some ways, in really deep ways, I found big T truth. Um, but in some other ways, we're all still searching and looking and we're looking for meaning and we're looking for relationship and we're looking for that which is gives me purpose. Why should I get up in the morning? Um, why should I go out the door? And when you're in depression, dark depression, you it's it's the most narcissistic thing in the world, right? It's it's all about you and it's all about who you are and it's all about your longings and your desires and you're angry with the world and you're mad at stuff. But that's what happens, uh, you know, God says in, in the, I mean, when we revolt against God in the garden, um, we become our own gods. You will be like God. Well, that was the longing. Well, now when you're your own God and life doesn't work out, who the hell are you going to blame? <laughs> like, you <can't, laughs> like you can't blame, you can't, you don't want to blame yourself, but that's, but you're your own God. God. You make your own rules. You do it your way. So then I think what comes out of that, um, and that's why I often think there, is a lot, there are a lot of people who profess to be atheists who I think are just really, really pissed off at God. They're just really angry. I don't know that they don't believe. I think they actually believe and they're just mad because they couldn't have it their way. And so I think there, there's that kind of, 
stuff going on in all this movement. And I think that that's helpful to me because in some ways I think that's my journey as well. So um, to come up on the other side to find joy and pleasure in life in, in God matters to me. And then, like I said before, I want that for my friends and I want that for people I'm in relationship with. Okay. Any other picking you want to do, Job? Picking. Or questioning, probing. I just, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't even know if we have a real solution to this, this thing. Like we seem to have, we seem to have found this, this positive thing, this potential. Where, where can we aim it? And, and, and I don't, I don't know, know that we've aimed anything to begin with. We sort of <laughs> flail around with it. And, and it seems to stick here and there, like with the Discord server. But again, I'm going in circles with that. Uh, it, I think it's the, there was this recent article in the Atlantic about uh, the secular churches and the assemblies, that sort of stuff. The problems they had that they tried to have a secular, uh, secular church. Paul, it reminded me of what you've said about the Canadian uh, uh, lady, I think, who uh, lost her faith or... or... Greta Vosper. Mm. The atheist Canadian yeah. pastor. Yeah, 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 yeah. It reminded me of that. And like re re so recently, I, uh, I was at a, at, a, at a conference at a bar and there was a, a person there. And we, had, we had a conversation and they're very much on, uh, on the woke left. And they said, Joe, we're, we're assholes. We're all assholes. And I'm in my usual, I can't help making jokes. I say, uh, I'm a Calvinist. I get it. And so, <laughs> yeah. and, I thought you were a Lutheran. You were for a little while ago. You were talking about Lutheran. Now you're a Calvinist. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, later he asks. And I was like, no, 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 I wasn't being serious. But, you know, I do go to a church. And he said, so, and he didn't know that. So then he asked me to explain, like, well, what does that mean? And it's not really very developed for me yet. But we had a conversation later at a bar that was just about very emotional things and suffering and crying. And, and I noticed I just, I, I give him lots of, like I listen to him and then I say some things and I notice all I'm doing is, is, is talking religious to him. And he's all like, yeah, that's so useful. These things you're saying, and I'm thinking, you're the last person who'd sit next to me in the church. Because to you, churches are not what, what. And like, how, how, how would I even, because as soon as I say, well, you know, if you, if you think this sort of stuff is helpful, you don't like coming to church, church with me. And they'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, yeah, because two years ago, I would have said the same to me. So I don't, I don't know how to solve this. You're pastors. What am I supposed to do? So, what, I, where, do, where do you want to aim it? Where do you want to take it? What? What? No, I need I need people to right. find out that these churches are not what they think they are, huh. and that we are as humans fundamentally religious creatures, and that that, that huh. religion can be used as a tool the way I use it. Now, you three might not agree with that, but that's the only way I can currently approach it. That sure. might change. I can't guarantee that, but oh, I, I, I can help other people the way I was able to help myself and the way other people help me, then I'm happy because I've, I, I have an existence I didn't even know was possible two years ago. And, and, and it's going to sound stupid, but last night we were in firefighter training. We're done. We're all cleaning up. We're dragging all the hoses out, just chatting and laughing. And I'm thinking, this is it. And, and I used to be sort of, that would sort of be happening to me. Like I was still doing the thing, cleaning up the hoses, doing the thing. But now it's more like you're right there with the other, doing the needing, the thing that needs to get done, the, the meaningful thing. And, and then I think I almost see it. And that sounds dumb, but I think that's the closest I can get. 
See, and see, so if I can get others to see that, sorry, Paul, then no, keep going. No, that that's where I was going to end with that. I think if I can give that to to the people who I see who suffer, I just don't know how to how to package it up nicely. Right. I mean, it's nice it's nice to be a fisher of man, but you got to have the right bait. <laughs> Well, and, and I actually think, well, if you listen to my Mark sermons, a little plug there from my own sermons, if you listen to my Mark sermons, I mean, the, the Greek is a little, you got to be, these are catchers in chaos of people. And, you know, so the Verveki stuff, so a lot of people, well, you know, of course, people kind of gathered around me because of Peterson, but then, you know, Strawn says, oh, go listen to that Verveki guy. And Verveki, so he's given me some new language and some new tools. And so he talks about four different ways of knowing. So there's, there's participatory knowing, there's perspectival knowing, there's procedural knowing, and there's propositional knowing. Part of what, in a sense, our earlier conversation in here revolved around was the, was the propositional knowing, because these propositional elements um, very much are a standard part of church profession in the Christian Reformed Church. Now, all of us, in a sense, what I'll have all of us together is Rod's church isn't technically Christian Reformed, but Rod is ordained in the Christian Reformed Church. Job, you're, you're from the mother church, um, and, there, and, and John and I are part of the Christian Reformed Church. But the Christian Reformed Church, along with many other churches, have this propositional knowing as sort of the these are the boundary markers. These are sort of the stakes in the ground that give the messiness of life certain places, certain benchmarks to locate ourselves by. And that's an important system. And, and if we think about that as, say, benchmarks or boundary markers, it, it's good to kind of know where you're standing. But if you're having a conversation with a group of people and, and there's kind of a pole over here and there's a pole over there where sometimes you're in in my yard and sometimes I'm in your yard and we're going on. There's also participatory and perspectival and procedural knowing. And I think part of what we've been talking about in this conversation and what you just described, Job, is maybe you don't have all four ways of knowing this yet, but they don't all come in. See, churches like to have them come in order basically because of the boundary markers, because churches because their institutions are sort of like bean counters. Well, we're going to put all these people in these beans. And so in the village, you have the, the real members who only sign up for a year, and you have the cousins. Now, now cousins are different than brothers and sisters. Um, and they're different in certain ways. And there are moments in which those differences are really important. But there are, other, there are many ways in which cousins are sort of like siblings. And so life is sort of that way. And all those ways of knowing are mixed up. Now, churches would love it if people kind of went through in order. But the truth is that we don't. And I think that's part of what your pastor, Job, is kind of hung up on. He's looking at you and saying, eh, Job's, Job's just ticking away at these knowing things. But proposition, you know, propositional is a little late. And you know, doctors have this with kids. Well, you know, Rodney's growing up gangbusters. Look at how big this kid is, but he can't seem to pay any attention in class. And then, you know, they put eyeglasses on him and bang, you can see. And, you know, this is the way life is in this crazy, broken, fallen world. Also a glorious world. So I, you know, I, there's, there's lots of cool stuff going on and I'm just happy to be a part of it. And I'm, for me, it's just enormously gratifying and humbling to, to, to have a role in it. So, but I think those four ways of knowing are really helpful to try to sort out, okay, well, we got stuff going on here. And Okay, but Paul, if I may. Of course you may, John. We, and that, we, you, you wouldn't stop you if I said it. I, you can't. Exactly. I'm going to keep right on talking. So, so, so we are now observing that, that while Job is really good at knowing let's say three quarters of your knowing types and is somewhat deficient from a certain perspective in, in the propositional uh, knowing of certain doctrines. And we are making it sound as though he is the deficient one and he is the one that should catch up. And he is the one that should conform to our expectations. But my point is that I wonder, and you said it very succinctly that we, as a Christian Reformed denomination, with a lot of eggs in our identity of knowing basket. And so propositionally, 
And so, and so I wonder if, if we have a kind of responsibility and I, and I, and, and, and I'm still kind of hammering away at what kind of church was able to embrace Job and how is Rod's church unique in that it embraces a lot of non-propositionally conforming people. I think that the burden is to some degree on the churches also to, to maybe um, reduce their emphasis on propositional knowing to make the truths a little bit more accessible to the uninitiated. And, and I say that to, to create a space and a platform where, where perhaps the, the, uh, the, 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 the propositional truths, important and real though they are, are not front and center as the markers of our sense of belonging to this community. Is that a legitimate way to talk about it or not? I, well, I think it's noteworthy that Job himself you know, when you express the fact, which I agree is quite likely, that they're probably, they're in their local church, they're probably tinkering with the um, their boundary markers because of Job, because what Job has done is added some new dynamics into their community. Now, I would, I would say that most churches and most Christians believe that it is finally God alone who draws the lines. And that is, that is really mm-hmm. important to say. And mm-hmm. there are plenty of places in Scripture where it's clear that the Bible itself has an understanding that lines are imperfectly seen and known here below. One of the great places, you know, one of my best illustrations for, for Jordan Peterson is the unauthorized exorcist where in the Gospel of Mark, there's some guy running around casting out demons in Jesus' names, and in Jesus' name, and Jesus' disciples decide they should maybe enforce some intellectual property. And so they go ask Jesus if they should make him stop, which would be a fun thing to kind of watch. We're going to beat you up if you stop, you know, unless you stop casting out demons in Jesus' name, you know, it's going to be bad for you. Um, and Jesus says, leave him alone. Now, what's with that? Um, and, and there's lots of ways in Scripture. And so most churches have a certain amount of formality in which they say, well, these are some posts. But in practice, the churches are usually quite flexible. And I've seen this in many, many situations. And this is why I think in mature, wise organizations, they are really a little hesitant about, you have to understand what rules are and what exceptions are. And you need to be able to navigate that world. And because you have both rules and exceptions, you understand that rules are rules, but there are exceptions. And so that's usually best figured out on the local level. But again, all of those things have to sort of come up nationally and and into the broader assemblies. And so we work those things out as we go. But I think it's helpful to recognize, you know, some of these, some of these, this new language in terms of there's more ways of knowing, which we've always known, it's been built into our languages for years, than this. And so we, as the local level, work through these things. I think it is finally important that these, these propositional truths over long periods of time matter. And, and an, another thing that I've learned in the last couple of years, because I've done a lot of learning in the last couple of years, is that many of the things that we deal with are not necessarily so important in the time frames that are important to us. We want something in the next two, three, four days, months, years. But many of these things probably have importance in terms of centuries. And be, because we don't live lives experientially self In terms of our narrative over centuries, we don't appreciate that framework. But if you look at the church over thousands of years, over thousands of places, well, you can appreciate that perspective. So we navigate here below. And it's it's not unlike if, let's say, you're hiking in the mountains 
Well, on the map, you see there's this wiggly line. It goes here, and your app will tell you the elevation and all of that. But when you're actually walking it, there's roots and rocks and turns and all these particularities. And so what we do, actually, is we navigate all of that complexity in the procedural, often, in the perspectival. And that's, in fact, what we're doing but still having to talk about the propositional because it's a very important and useful aspect to the entire thing. Love it. <laughs> yeah. I'll incorporate uh, that in my banner article. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, uh, go ahead, Job. Mm. Well, uh, I, I was going to reflect on how I just noticed, like, I've joined this church, I'm really happy there. What do I do? I start like this and this and that. I don't like that. That's, I should I should keep my damn hands to myself. But <laughs> No, you shouldn't. Then, because um, you are such an important person for that church, and you don't appreciate it. But the other 799 people that have been in that place for years who haven't seen a lot of people like you darken their door – they know how important you are because you are learning for them. Mm. You are. And that's why your pastor, who is no dummy, I've picked that up from listening to you, just watching how he's navigated your interesting situation. He's using, as I call in my channel, the spirit of finesse. He is feeling his way forward. So you're guided by all of the signposts and markers, but you do have to feel your way forward. Rod's church is one enormous experiment in an improvisation. We, we make it up every day as we go, no doubt. Yeah. About Rodney was a failed church planter who bumped into Eric, and, and the Christian Reformed Church had enough money to say, ah, right, Rod, just do something worthwhile, and boom, <laughs> here's this church that comes out of it. And there's annoying aspects. Is it? How's its relationship to the Christian Reformed Church and all of these difficult things? But it's beautiful, and, and there's amazing ministry. And people listening to us would probably think, that village church, that must be a mega church in Tucson. <laughs> uh, not yet. Not quite. What is it if you're in Tucson? Uh, uh, two, uh, two, week, two weeks ago, I counted how many people were in both services, and it was uh, 180 people, which was really cool. Then we had... Um, uh, Labor Day weekend, <laughs> and the entire church went camping, and there were like twenty or maybe forty people in the morning service and twenty-five at night. You know, it's like, oh wow, this is just like, and that's kind of fun. I, I appreciate that too. And then I, I, the rest of the story is, um, so my friend Andy Littleton and uh, and Nick Lang, my, they're they're planting another church in Tucson called Mission Church. And they decide they want to become part of the Christian Reformed Church, sort of. At least they do. They want to get ordained in it. They want, and they're trying to figure it out, right? Like, how do we become part of this? So, so Andy says, I'm going to become a commissioned pastor just like Rod. And just the other day, uh, he's going to get examined in two weeks. Uh, just the other day, um, the guy that's overseeing, Andy DeCourt, who's overseeing kind of what he has to do, um, submitted all the documents that he's had to fill out from all the books that he read and all the it's 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 a half inch thick right it's he, he was saying well it's all it's it's just all this paper that has to be you know because you got to make sure your eyes are dotted and your t's are crossed and he's done everything and he's read this learning plan this is a guy who started five years ago with nothing and now they have a building with 100 people in it every sunday worshiping all from scratch just because we've been walking together, I've seen, I've got to see this whole thing close up, but we still have all these standards and all these expectations and requirements of the real people, the the pastors. The, and, and Joe, what I love about you is you're, you bring the light to people like you walk into the village and they challenge everything we believe and they they don't believe what we believe and they don't think the way we think and they don't have a, their culture is completely different and we're just all stumbling around going like i used to say every every time like the village changes every person's life who walks into it and the truth is and that's a truth that is absolutely true that walks into the these our lives like changes our culture we change their culture they change our culture it's mutual and and if you don't understand that then you're going to miss out on all the beauty of what of what happens in a church and so yes 
you, and why can't I be a member? Why can't I take communion? Why shouldn't I do this? Those are fabulous questions because it makes us wrestle with stuff we don't have to wrestle with if we're all in just singing the same tune. And, and you only get that from people who try to get in. Poor Andy, Andy Littleton is trying to get in and he's like, holy cow, there's a lot of requirements here. And then do I want to jump through all these hoops just so I can say, I want to be part of this family, this group, this understanding of what the church is, well, maybe. But, um, but even, on a, on, even on, a, on a much smaller scale for the four of us, to have that schmuck from Holland refer to himself as a pastor. And we all know what he stands for. Right. We all know what he believes and doesn't believe. And you know what happens? He makes, Job, you make each one of us rethink our own roles as pastors. Because we are now all of a, think, all of a sudden, at least I am, thinking, hey, so this is why people refer to Job as a pastor. What is it that they see that makes them think that he is a pastor? This is and Job. Why do, and what? No, 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 no. no. That, that may well be. No, no, that no, may no, well be. But this far. has this has gone way past the joke stage. <laughs> way past the joke stage. So the guy who, as a guy who writes a lot of uh, humor and and does a lot of that. We tell the truth in humor. We and so when they're joking, they ain't joking, buddy. Right. And 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 I I just speak for myself. Just the fact that you have a way of articulating what you do and how you reach out to other people around you forces me to rethink how I fulfill my own role as a pastor and how I interact with the people around me. And I think we all do that. And I think that that, that is kind of a, the nature of the beast. And, and I appreciate what you bring to the table a lot. I, I put my hand, a little while, I'm quoting you. I put my hand on his shoulder and we wept and cried. And, yeah, right. And exactly. Said, yeah. Oh, boy, if that isn't a pastor, I'd like to know what the heck it is. <laughs> it's procedural but, knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it's done. <laughs> I mean, more that I don't need. I, I, now I'm concerned that my church is changing their rules because I happen to wander in, in there, but I, I, I don't want them, I hope they don't because it's not their problem. I'm figuring things out. I, I, I mean, if, if I look at my hierarchy, what I want is to be knee deep in that church at work, trying to make sure more people find out about it. And, <laughs> And he says, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> Evangelism. No. I'm, I'm screwed. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if you are, we all are. I'm so far. Um, no, but honestly, it's, it is. So don't think I don't see the irony here. When I, when I was younger, I was like, I will see the day that religion is gone. And now I'm like, these buildings are essential and we need more people in there. So yeah, I see that. But I can't help myself. If this is what I must do, then I'll do it. And, and then maybe I'll have peace with myself. But I, I, need, I need that church to, to so I'll, I'll, I'll just lie to myself and say, they're not changing for me. They're just doing their own thing. Cool, fine. But Just keep saying that, Job. Yeah. And, and, and whatever I believe or don't believe, well, I don't know, I'll figure that out. But in the meantime, I need to make sure that we keep this momentum going. That's how this whole thing started. See, <laughs> see, see at first, where you said this email, like, yeah, we need to have a conversation with three other pastors. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> they want me to stop pretending I'm a pastor. But uh, no, it's not like that. No, we want, to, we want you to stop saying you're not a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That needs at least a university education, Paul, so that's not going to work out. At least in this country where we take this stuff seriously. This is not the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Over in the U.S., you loosey-goosey evangelical kinds. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, this was a fun conversation. This took some interesting turns. <laughs> How, how should we wrap this thing up? 
Ah, no, okay, explain the resurrection to me so I can properly internalize it. You, we got 15 you, you minutes. Still, you still haven't figured out how people learn. You, it, it's okay, there's propositional, there's perspectival, there's participatory. And I, I would say the Discord, I haven't been watching your videos. Hey, Job, are you experiencing some kind of new life right now? Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. with, with your I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it's not the same thing. That's what my pastor said, and I don't agree with him. <laughs> my, my, so, so it's interesting because I asked him about this, and he said, well, the resurrection is look at Jesus as the ideal state of human existence. Jesus was the perfect human. That's how humans should be. And that. If we follow him, that is what gets reborn continuously. Mm -hmm. And if I'm perfectly honest with myself, that reminded me of how certain people would explain reincarnation in Western Buddhism. Like, well, us constantly working on ourselves, that's how we reincarnate from a fallen state to an enlightened state. It's all the same mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, Go ahead, Paul. So I was listening to, now Rod won't know who these people are. I was listening to Esther and Tripp talk to Adam and they got into a, they got into an argument about the resurrection. And in my opinion, uh, Esther and Tripp took it in a totally wrong way. If you read C.S. Lewis's, I think it's in Miracles. If you ask C.S. Lewis, what is the resurrection? He'll say, everyone's fighting about those first few moments that happened on Easter Sunday morning. Now, this isn't to deny what happens in those first few moments, but Jesus' resurrection is qualitatively different from Jesus raising Jairus' daughter or the young man who he met going out of town and all of these things, because the resurrection is the beginning of new life. Now, is it archetypal? Yes. Is it symbolic? Yes. Now, you, you can probably believe it's archetypal and probably believe it's symbolic. You're a little, you're a little uh, you know, skeptical about the historical thing. I think your issues aren't so much with, um, I think your issues are probably more philosophical than anything else, but you're already beginning to embody the archetypal and the symbolic. The historical will come, I think. But it's, it's, it's because... And, well, if there's one thing that I've, not if there's one thing, there's so many things that I've learned, but one of the things is that through the whole Jordan Peterson thing, I am more convinced than ever of the historicity of the resurrection because, not because I can somehow imagine 2,000 years ago what happened outside of a tomb, but because just like I can believe that there was a big water accident in Southern California that created the Salton Sea because I can see the Salton Sea. Now, I wasn't there to see the water accident where all kinds of water was diverted and it made some crazy inland sea. I see the sea. And, and that's N.T. Wright's argument for the historicity of the resurrection. Do you want to believe in the resurrection? Look at the church. And yeah. so I, I think, you know, I... You're just, a, you're just a late bloomer on the propositional stuff. But all of that is so easy to believe because of the history of the West for the last thousand years. So I'm not concerned. It'll come. The day is young. A uh, homeless guy's at my door. You guys keep talking. I got to deal with him a second. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That, that was a good attempt. It's like he's done it before. <laughs> we uh, we have a guy that hangs around our church too. It's really fun to uh, like interact with him, and then it's yeah, food today, and and then and now he just walks in like he owns the place, right? It's you know goes over the refrigerator, gets some food, walks out, says see you later, and walks out. So it's, that is a fun. I have a homeless guy in one of my JBP meetup groups, and. Uh, He's a good guy to know also. What I love about Andy's church uh, here in Tucson is they don't call them homeless people. They call them houseless people because here, because here you have a home. I think that is like the coolest Ooh, thing ever. That's like, one to steal. Isn't, mm. that, isn't that like 
he, here, here are our homeless people, uh, not homeless people, here are our houseless people. Um, they don't have a place to live, but they have a home. And I just, yeah, I, it makes me weep every time I hear it. I just, ah, yes, that's what I long for. Because most of us are kind of creeped out and like, uh, okay, another one. <laughs> like another needy person. Uh, but yeah, fun stuff. Well, if, if, if there is to be any kind of a specific conclusion to this conversation at all. I mean, there, there is, I hope that, I hope that you have a little bit of a picture, uh, Job, of how the rest of us uh, have experienced this, this phenomenon and, and, and where it takes us. I, for me, it has um, very much pushed me back to the local congregation and the fact that I am able to have those kinds of conversations right now with the leadership of Cross Point Church is uh, really encouraging and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, but we all need to be giving each other language about how to do that. And we need to be, um, I think that we need to be somewhat supporting one another in, in, in very real ways, which I know we do. And so I'm not concerned about it, but, but there is, there is, a, I think there's just something really cool about knowing that there's four guys thinking about how their church life and their churches can, can, can put them on a path of connecting with with uh, with a whole world out there that that our church membership uh, is still somewhat isolated from, and to build that bridge and to make that connection, I think is kind of a worthwhile uh, endeavor. So I'm glad to be part of it. And Joe, I greatly appreciate your endeavor to show the goodness of the church to show the meaning of the church, the, the, the joy of being part of. I think that's huge. I, um, because I think uh, to take away the animosity, to take away the distancing, uh, all the stuff that we do to create distance um, and to create and to say, no, this is, this is actually a safe space. It's a good space. And it's not generally, it's not all completely true, as most truths aren't. So it's not comprehensive that you can't just walk into any church and be, because uh, there's the Westboro Baptists and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, but there's, but in general, I think, um, I appreciate your endeavor to create, um, uh, to, to lessen the distance uh, between uh, those who are atheists and those who are part of, part of a church. I don't think I'd be able to not do it, but I appreciate it. Yep. yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what makes you a pastor, man. It's, it's weird. Ah, but it's good. All right. I'm yeah, gonna, I'm not saying it's man. I'm going to stop the recording, and then we can have a little after show. And um, thank you all for watching. And uh, as if I have to tell people to leave a comment, uh, they just love commenting. There and won't this, be comments for this one. They'll, they'll. I'll, shall I? You know, if I turned off comments for this video, can you imagine <laughs> the outrage? <laughs> Nothing controversial in here at all. <laughs> oh gosh. You mean you are going to post it, Paul? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna post it. <laughs> I would, I, I, I'm definitely gonna post this one. Yeah, one of these one of these days, I know. I, yeah, anyway, yeah, shut my mouth. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for watching.